Hello and welcome to Gold the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was the greatest era of action movies in the history of time. I'm still working on it. I said last <laughs> time I was going to work on it. I, in fact, did not work on it. At so, all. No, <laughs> and it shows. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you're going to have to do? It, is you're going to have to do something fitting for the like 80s and 90s action and do like a announcer voice. <laughs> yeah. Like, you should do boom. like you're announcing you know? uh, American Gladiators or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I promise in this next two week stretch, I will think about it. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to tell you he won't. No. <laughs> this week on our new reformatted podcast, just a reminder, this is a reformatted podcast. We are not Miami Vice anymore, although we love Miami Vice. We are a new podcast about movies from the greatest action era, 1975 to 1995. So we are not talking about Miami Vice anymore. Although well, they have a they have a Vice connection so far. We've had mm-hmm. our two movies have a Vice mm-hmm. connection. Yep, we're always going to keep yeah. that Vice connection. Yeah, we can't help going away from Miami Vice. We just ran out of Miami Vice. <laughs> so until there's new Miami Vice, we'll just have to find new ways to entertain ourselves. <laughs> It's hard, but we we try. <laughs> we've talked about Miami Vice for three consecutive years, and I think we've covered Miami Vice very well. So I'm really excited to be talking about movies now that are from the same era. And there's a lot of Vice connections. And I put together a list, as I showed you guys last week. There's this list of movies like, hey, here's all the people who appeared in a Miami Vice episode that are also in all these amazing movies through this era. And like, man, the late 80s, the early 90s, you are guaranteed to have a vice connection. And speaking of vice connections, there are many in this week's movie that we chose. Now, this is a classic. This is much different than Harley Davidson and the Marvel Man, which is a little bit of a deeper cut from that era. This is a a big-time action movie that we selected from this. The movie that we selected this week is The Last Boy Scout, which originally premiered on December 13th, 1991. As I mentioned, this is a powerhouse movie. It is written by Shane Black, that Shane Black. You might know some of his movies as being the writer of the Lethal Weapon franchise, The Monster Squad, Last Action Hero, The Long Kiss Goodnight. He was also a writer slash director on Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, and The Nice Guys. And oh, by the way, he was also an actor. He was in Predator, Dead Heat, and RoboCop 3. Just, I mean, just a little (laughs) stuff. He was in a little bit of stuff. And he did a little bit of stuff, too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All our favorites, by the way. Oh, they're all classic. Yeah, including exactly. Dead Heat. That's a pretty impressive <laughs> resume. Don't forget about Monster Squad. That movie's amazing. <laughs> true. True. You, the movie is directed, The Last Boy Scout is directed by Tony Scott. Another I'm powerhouse. A, I'm going to take a pause here. This is not just a powerhouse. He is legitimately one of the all-time Hollywood greats. Here is a selected filmography from Tony Scott. Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop 2, Days of Thunder, True Romance, The Fan, Spy Game, Man on Fire, The Taking of Pelham, 1, 2, 3. That is a selection of the movies that he has directed. Tony Scott is a distinct difference from Ridley, although Ridley Scott is a great director. Tony Scott is one of the all-time Hollywood greats. He brought back single-handedly the action Mm -hmm. genre and rebirthed it in a time when it was dying. Unfortunately, Tony Scott died in 2012. And there are two people in the movie business where I can say, like, I'm not associated with the movie business. Hollywood, for me, as, as a fan, was better when Tony Scott and Chris Penn were making movies. And unfortunately, we don't have either of them anymore. That is very true. Now, normally we skip on the producer. We don't talk about the producers of episodes or movies, something like that. But this is this is a different story. This is a powerhouse movie. Shane Black, Tony Scott. We haven't even gotten into the guest stars, but I have to stop and talk about the producer. The producer is Joel Silver. A lot, not a lot of people know about oh, yeah. producers, but this Joel Silver is a personality in his own. I'm not going to go deep into it, but there's lots to read about with Joel Silver. He is a personality. There's lots of people have opinions about him. He's been involved in a lot of movies. Lots he is, of people have negative opinions. <laughs> he has a very strong <laughs> personality. However, he is something special in Hollywood because he has made an uncanny amount of movies that fit right into the realm of this podcast. Like we could do a whole podcast that's just about Joel Sil- Silver movies. Here is a selected movie that he is the producer on. The original Warriors, 48 Hours, Weird Science, Commando, Lethal Weapon, Predator, Action Jackson, Die Hard, Ricochet, The Matrix, V for Vendetta, The Book of Eli, and Rock and Roller. Yeah, so all of my favorites <laughs> except The Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I love how The Matrix is the one you picked out of there, not The Book of Eli or anything Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> rock and Roller, I love that movie. Those Matrix movies need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like Matrix movies. <laughs> he 
took chances on so many action movies and like Tony Scott re-engineered and rebirthed the action genre and changed it forever in the 80s. And he continues to make a ton of movies. And like I mentioned, he has a big personality. There's lots of great stuff to read about Joel Silver out there. So before we get started, check in and see what's going on in each other's lives and pals. Tonight, or sorry, on I think it is Today. tonight, as we record, which is Sunday, October 20th, the first episode of the HBO series The Watchmen, starring Don Johnson and some other 80s and classics. Lou Gossett Jr. Regina King's in it, too. Mm-hmm. She'd been in a bunch of stuff in the 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's pre- that premiered tonight and it's gonna be really interesting to see tomorrow what the the feelings are on that show tomorrow and this is one of our opportunities where we talked about how the podcast is changing and the opportunities that that gives us doing a spin-off short run spin-off show about the watchman totally a possibility especially because of don johnson yes and on two fronts i love the don johnson and i am also very much a geek and love comic books and the watchman is totally my jam so <laughs> i would love to geek out with some people over the watchman we'd love to hear from you if you're listening to the show and you're like you know what? i would love to go with the heat treatment on the watchman then let us know email us go with the heat at gmail.com get us on twitter or facebook message us let us know we're gonna keep it running tally we won't do them like as they come out what we probably do is after actually after the run ends yeah then go do, back and do it do a whole bunch of them um or at least get like three or four ahead that way we can give it the proper go with the heat treatment of all the guest stars and any music or anything like that that, that appears in the episode instead of just doing a reaction podcast doing like more of like a deep dive like this is what the story was about a lot of these things that we talk about and the same thing with the the episodes of ice when we we're doing that they were we were watching them like repeatedly to get all the information that we needed to be able to put it together i think it's different when you do it mm-hmm. that way than just doing a reaction one because a lot of people are going to do the reaction mm-hmm. podcast so yeah we'd love to hear from you and let us know if you would like us to do a watchman series email us gold at gmail.com well without further ado let's dive into the last boy scout and the greatness that was 1991 actually you're going to see a theme over the next few months of movies because there is a 1991 is a fantastic year for action movies <laughs> i don't care how much they actually sold yeah. at the box office it is a great year for yeah, action exactly. movies <laughs> so let's go give the last boy scout the go with the heat treatment so when we open up friday night football actually i'll give this guy credit this is way better than hank williams jr also friday night is well, a better and- night <laughs> than monday night and thursday night <laughs> I'll get into this more in music, but they actually commissioned a full-out song for this. <laughs> Friday night's not a bad night for football. But, I mean, the song you know, says I, it's I'm... a great night for football. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I don't know if you heard that. It said that Friday night, the, the actual lyrics <laughs> of the song are, Friday night's yes. a great night for football. <laughs> Very simple and I to the point. Make, <laughs> I, I just want to make the point that 1991 Thursday night football didn't exist. And I was always curious why they chose Thursday night instead of Friday night. Like, why Why is Thursday special? Why we want it in the middle of the week like that? I, so I we, guess they're worried about we, we could have, with people going out for the night. I think so. I think it is, too. I felt like we were c- probably close to having a Friday night football in reality. Who knows why they ended up going with Thursday, but I'm sure that was part of the conversation. Based on this song... Thursday's not a great night <laughs> for football. <laughs> <laughs> That's and the song is proof. <laughs> <laughs> the action that we see on the field, this is an all-time classic movie opening. Because, <laughs> because it, I mean, it has to do with gambling, because the football player gets to call at halftime in a very rainy game. It's an incredibly brutal game. Like, they are just, guys are just punching each other between plays. It's the most random, too, the full pro football experience but like they've added stuff like there's a marching band why is there a marching band i could not figure that out i'm like is this high school or something what's going on college <laughs> well billy cole the star running back or wide receiver whatever he plays because he's, he's in not the, the quarterback and he also catches a pass uh he mm-hmm. is having the game of his life but he gets a call at halftime from someone that says that there's a lot of money riding on this game you got to do what you got to do to cover the spread maybe or win the game i think game that was the whatever. owner of the I thought that what, was Mark Cohn. What, well, what, what, was that the voice? I think that's what that was. All I know is that it was a very scary phone call because it immediately changed his re- the reaction on his face. Goes back to his locker, does some drugs, and then gets his gun because that's going to yeah. help him do better. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> I do want to give a big shout out to Lynn Swan. 
who, as a on-the-field interviewer, asked the owner, ratings are down. Is football dying? Are there no heroes left? <laughs> Bold. <laughs> Clearly, he does not work for the NFL Network. Otherwise, <laughs> he would be fired right now. <laughs> then, of course, as you do, a lot of money is riding on the game. you got to score a touchdown. The only way you can guarantee the win <laughs> is that you catch that pass and go 95 yards downfield shooting people as you go. This is why this is a classic moment because A, no, no. it See, works. you're focusing on the wrong part of the play. You are so focusing on the wrong part of the play. He doesn't start shooting people right away. He actually yeah, breaks he like four field. tackles. <laughs> yeah. He yeah, breaks like four tackles first and then he starts shooting people. And I think Which, the point is, is that if there wasn't such terrible tackling, he would have never gotten to the point where he could pull the gun to shoot people. This is all the other like team's was, fault. I just thought it was unnecessary to shoot those people. I think he could have juked him out and just scored without <laughs> shooting them. It's just terrible tackling. Yeah. It also means that it, that it works, right? I mean, that's what the final score of the game is going to be after shooting four people on the field and scoring that touchdown. I mean, That's yeah. going to cover the gambling. Yeah, it doesn't. they don't matter that he got that shot. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. I don't know. I think technically shooting someone is a penalty, so I don't think that play would have counted. <laughs> I think they had to make new penalties after that game. <laughs> They did not. It was not a penalty before. It was just a crime. <laughs> now, and I think from a time frame being in 1991, we're supposed to assume that the team in LA is obviously. I think still. Did, I don't know. Had the Raiders moved back from LA yet? In no, 91? they were still I in think LA. They were still in LA. They didn't move. Yeah, so they didn't move back to like Oakland until like 95, like 94, 95. Yeah, kind of oh yeah, this was supposed to be, to be the Raiders. <laughs> Billy breaks all those tackle scores, an amazing touchdown that takes a knee and says, ain't life a bitch, and kills himself right there on the field. The only way that this actually ties to anything in the movie is, A, it's on the team that eventually Hallenbeck is going to be investigating, and B, it's about gambling. Otherwise, all of this is totally unnecessary just to be a badass opening. Yeah. I think that it was supposed to be like a little bit to give you a deeper dive into like later on when... Damon Wayne talks about how the league just eats you up and chews you up and spits you out and all that. Like that's legitimately what they did to this guy, right? He's got all this pressure and he's so, on drugs and he's so it was supposed to be like some big statement about <laughs> football. We just so missed Friday it. Friday night's busy, like, not a great night for football. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Friday night is not a good not anymore. It's ruined. That's why they didn't do Thursday night football because they got ruined by that movie. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't do, they couldn't yeah, couldn't do, do Friday. Friday yeah. night because too many people are dying. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want people to think they can pull a gun and shoot other people if the chargers did that maybe some people would come to the games <laughs> <laughs> while the uh song was being played that's when they're doing the opening credits over the top of the the friday night song this is our chance to stop now it's all under one tony scott great opening yes so this is now where we're going to pause to talk about the guest stars of which there are i mean for, for a lot the, for the rest of the 90s these are Mm -hmm. Or currently, and then the rest of these, these are the A-listers. What do you got for us, John? I will not be throwing these notes out, as I will be using them in multiple for multiple other movies, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the big star. Bruce Willis, who plays Joe Hallenbach. Obviously, Walter Bruce Willis Buck Buck. Uh, <laughs> if you are familiar with our time podcasting for... Miami Vice, you know that we love us some Buck Buck. The Die Hard movies, and this is this movie kind of comes out in that Die Hard movie stretch. This is right around the time of Die Hard 2, kind of between 2 and 3. You could almost call The Last Boy Scout Die Hard 2 and a half, you know, because he's essentially playing that same character. It's he the same character. A lot. Remember, he, he rescues Holly in Die Hard 2, but then Holly doesn't return in Die Hard 3. This kind of feels like this yeah. is actually Die Hard 2.5. Because Holly's a bitch. <laughs> Well, I said and it. <laughs> every Die Hard after Die Hard 2, he's divorced. This is perfect to like be the in-between Die Hard movie. But getting back to Bruce Willis, he was in Moonlighting with Sybil Shepard, where he played a detective like he does in this movie. <laughs> this got released right around the same time as Hudson Hawk voiced Mikey in the Look Who's Talking movies. But this was all right before Pulp Fiction, which kind of really kind of helped break his career out. I feel like Pulp Fiction was kind of help, helped him get out of that, that character from that Die Hard movie. Like that's what propelled him into starting to do like he did the fifth element sixth sense 
the Unbreakable movie, and they started to do more comedic roles, like whole nine yards, the whole ten yard, and then the Red 1 and Red 2 movies. All of this made it perfect segue, right, for him to start doing direct-to-Netflix movies. Those are the best ones. <laughs> always had a little bit of comedic side as you know going back to the bruno character which also led to his album so let, let's move on let's get to damon wayans who plays jimmy Dix. he's the third of 10 wayans siblings he has a club foot and he had to wear leg braces going up growing up he was actually quite bullied and had to overcome that to kind of break out and get into comedy and eventually acting. It definitely helps having a brother like Keenan Ivory Wayans. So he actually got a start. He followed his brother out to L.A., um, and he would start doing stand-up in 82. He also had a short run of appearances on SNL in 85 to 86. Before eventually getting his big start on In Living Color, he did the sketch comedy thing, but also did a bunch of comedy movies after that based on that, like Earth Girls or Easy and stuff like that. I'm Gonna Get You Sucker was one of his brother's movies. Mo Money. All so. we care about is that the as many of the Wayans can survive gold chain death as possible. <laughs> that laugh tells me John's never seen I'm gonna get you fuck up <laughs> he's like huh, huh, I don't know uh, what I'm no. talking about <laughs> it, it's, it's been a while right after this movie he hit his stride with movies like Major Pain Bulletproof Celtic Pride he would eventually settle a into a TV show called My Wife and Kids in 01. And even recently, he played Murtaugh on Fox's Lethal Weapon television show. Our next guest star is Chelsea Field, who plays Sarah Hallen Beck. And Chelsea Field was also in our movie last week. Ah, uh, Virginia Slim. She also played Tila in 87's Masters of the Universe. You remember I mentioned she was married to Scott Bakula? We may even talk about her depending on whether or not we, if we do, uh, say, Commando next week, she has a bit <laughs> part in that. We can talk about her again. So if you want to hear more about her or just hear me say the same things I just said, uh, listen <laughs> so to she's... our episode last week. <laughs> so she slept with a lot of really... <laughs> In in the movie genre, she's had a lot of very good looking husbands. <laughs> or she's been with Don Johnson, Bruce Willis, and then apparently probably Arnold too if she's in Commando. Our next guest star is Noble Willingham, plays Sheldon Maricone, who's the uh, owner in the movie. He appeared in over thirty films, including Ace Ventura in ninety four, Chinatown in seventy four, and City Slickers also in ninety one. He actually earned his master's from Baylor in educational psychology. College and he was a teacher for a long time for following his lifelong dream of becoming an actor. Aside from being in over 30 films, he also had reoccurring TV roles on Home Improvement, Walker, Texas Ranger, and Murder, She Wrote. Which he looks like he would be on Walker, Texas Ranger. Totally, totally. He's the nice sheriff from one town over that likes to help when he can. <laughs> Our next guest star is Taylor Negron. He plays Milo. So his career actually started in high school with an appearance at the famous comedy store in L.A. Actually, he kind of studied under Lucille Ball, and he actually worked as Ball's intern for a while. Some of his more notable roles are he played the pizza guy in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. He was the tenacious son-in-law in Rodney Dangerfield's Easy Money. He was in Biodome, Angels in the Outfield. He is on a wide really array wide, of yeah. stuff. <laughs> Better off dead. So as far as TV goes, some episodes of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Reno 911, some kids shows, That's So Raven and Wizards of Waverly Place. <laughs> it's um, <going> much <laughs> unfortunately he passed away of liver cancer in 2015 mm. but i guess he also wrote a number of plays and was actually quite an accomplished painter too wow. our next guest star is danielle harris who plays dorian Hallen Beck. and guys she's actually a kind of known as the sc scream queen mm. she has a Bunch of credits in horror films. She was in four of the Halloween movies. Yeah. She was in Urban Legend, Stakeland, the Hatchet series. Oh, really? Her early career, she was a child actress. She was in Marked for Death, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, Free Willy, 
Daylight. She's actually done some pretty impressive voice work, too. She was Debbie Thornberry in the Wild Thornberries mm. and the Rugrats Gone Wild movie. Also, just a small side note, she was stopped in 1985 by a guy obsessed with her character, Molly Tilden, from an episode from of Roseanne. Roseanne. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought yeah. you say. I was she actually went on Dr. That. Phil and talked about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know her from Roseanne. That's what I know her from because she she was like on a, a season as a as the neighbor next door, Molly. Our next guest star is Holly Berry, who plays Corey. And guys, she is a big get. Too bad she's not in this movie very long. Before becoming an actress, she was a model. She was the first runner up in a Miss USA pageant, and then sixth in a Miss Universe uh, in 1986. Mm. She got her start in acting on a t- short-lived TV sitcom on ABC in 1989 called Living Doll. Living Dolls, by the way, was a spinoff of Who's the Boss? It I was remember where, that! <laughs> it was where <laughs> Alyssa, Alyssa Milano's characters, one of her friends, Charlie, uh-huh. who was played by Leanne Remini, yeah, uh, the girl King from of King of Queens. Yeah, I remember it. I yeah, totally remember it. It was about it. her journey on becoming a model. That was her sitcom. <laughs> so, like, weird connection there with, with them in Scientology. Yeah, it was um, like these models. <laughs> yeah, these models that, like, lived in this apartment together with some old lady. And she was, like, their, their like, uh, agent. So, it's like all these teenage girls living in an apartment in New York trying to make it as models. And that, that some lady's supposed to take care of them. And that was Holly Berry's first acting gig. She would uh, transition into movies in 91. And she would actually, she'd have three in 91. She'd have this movie, Jungle Fever, and Strictly Business. But her breakthrough role would come in 92 with Boomerang alongside Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. That would lead to some more mainstream stuff like the Flintstones in 94 and then Bullworth and that would lead to Password Swordfish and she would kind of break out from there. She's been in the X-Men movies. She, she was Catwoman. She was a Bond girl in Die Another Day. Cloud Atlas is one of our more recent favorite ones. But guys, she won an Academy Award for Best Actress with 2001's Monsters Ball. Mm-hmm. And to date is the only African American woman to have ever won that award. Oh, wow. that's a good movie. Wow. Can you I mean, that? yeah, yeah, it's a good movie. But... For, for Monsters Ball, a little bit of personal stuff. Uh, so apparently, due during filming of this movie, she was actually dating a guy. Uh, her boyfriend was abusive. He actually punctured her eardrum, and she lost eighty percent of her hearing in one of her ears during the filming of this. Uh, she uh, she said it afterwards in an interview. But she never said who she was dating, just that it was someone that everyone would know in Hollywood. A little bit of scandalousness. Apparently, she was sued by a Chicago dentist, John Ronan. He sued her $80,000 because he said from 1989 to 1991 until this movie came out that he had given her loans to help her get her career started. Okay. I don't know who won the lawsuit. That, I just thought it was funny that, that, that some is dentist was giving her money. Weird how, how does a dentist in Chicago have a Hollywood connection? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was just funding her. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yes. I mm-hmm. mean, you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. I don't want to talk to I love Halle Berry. I don't want to talk to <laughs> Our next guest star is Bruce McGill. And we're starting to get to the guest stars who weren't in the movie for more than about two scenes. So I think we're going to speed things up a bit. Bruce McGill played Mike Matthews. He's had a long acting career, which has included movies like Wildcats, My Cousin Vinny, Cliffhanger, Time Cop, which we all love. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> the sum of all fears. But his first role might be one of his, mo- probably his most memorable. As a desperate young unemployed actor, he took the role as D-Day in the National Lampoon's Animal House. Oh, oh yes. my God. Is that that, is? Is? that yeah. was his first role. Oh that my was God. Him. The guy on the motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> We're yes. just like all hit us at once. <laughs> is so, he also I, in Miami gonna... Vice too? That- yeah, I was going to yeah. throw that out there. His TV <laughs> like, roles <wait> <laughs> also include Crime Story, an episode of Crime Story, an episode of Miami Vice. Guys, in 91, he was also in a TV movie that would never get made in these days. It was called Shoot First, A Cop's Vengeance. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <All> right, next... <laughs> Our next guest stars, and I, I want to pair these guest stars together. Kim Coates, who plays Chet, and Frank Coliz, Coliz, Frank Collison. <laughs> Co- Co- I'm sorry, C O L L I S O N. I don't know what to put the emphasis Frank. on. <laughs> Goes by Frank. 
<laughs> plays Pablo. And I wanted to put them both together because they both show up in the same scene. They're the thugs that kidnap Buck Buck. Kim Coates had a long stand on Sons of Anarchy as Tig. He also shows up in over 40 films. And Fred Cullison, Kal- uh, he played in 119 episodes of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. He was the guy that worked at Telegraph. He was also in the <laughs> Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman movie. He was also in episodes of Moonlighting with Bruce Willis. Billy Blanks, who we talked about in the open, plays Billy Cole. He's also the Tybo guy from the workout tapes. He also did stunt work in the movie Kazam with Shaq. He's played mostly himself or characters named Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Some hey. of his movie credits include Showdown in 93, Lionheart in 90 with John Claude Van Damme, he was a prison thug in Tango and Cash, and in 89 Blood Fist. All of that should tell you that Billy Blinks will come up again in this podcast. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. And I'm going to say not only will we come up again in this because he's been in some like, you know, some amazing for maybe not all the right reason action movies, but... I will say of the 80s action stars, he is a forgotten star and history has moved on without him. And Billy, if you go back and watch Billy Blank's movies, even though the movies are crap, he is good. He is a good action saying, star. Yeah. That, yeah he's saying, and he's earned his expendables role. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But everyone overlooks Billy Blank's because they weren't like huge blockbusters, just consistently decent action movies. And I'm not going to stop talking about Billy Blanks until he gets his due, goddammit. <laughs> well, let me just say, I just want to throw out two more names. A shout out to Morris Chestnut, who is the locker room kid in the open. He mm. also played Ricky Baker, the star running back in Boys in the Hood, also mm. in 91. And then Eddie Griffin plays the MC. And I wanted to shout out Eddie Griffin because he's one of my favorite comedians. Uh, he's had a long, long stand-up comedy career. And I absolutely love his documentary in 03 called Dysfunctional Family. And those are your guest stars. After the crucial opening in this movie of learning about how football players can also run and shoot, which is actually, it's really hard. <laughs> People don't <laughs> and give, hold a football. <laughs> exactly. In full pants. Yeah. Like in that kind of accuracy. Like this gun only holds six bullets. Jesus Christ, he's a great shot. I don't know. I, I imagine it's not as hard as skiing and shooting, which is an <laughs> Olympic event. But in the very beginning, we get two scenes. One, we get at the Hallenbeck office of Joe Bruce Willis. To see what kind of state his life is in. That's his office where he sleeps in that car? <laughs> well, he stops by his oh, office. Okay. I was he, like, wait a minute. What? Yeah, so he, you see him sleeping in his car. He gets a dead squirrel thrown on him. He goes like you do. It's <laughs> LA. <laughs> <laughs> they have a bunch of dead squirrels laying around just throw at you. <laughs> I think the early scenes, we, we get really fed that he is a kind of a drunk, private eye, kind of his life is a mess, you know, waking up in the car. He even says when he, after he talks to Mike, the person who throws him this bone for the Corey job, says, I'm a loser, nobody likes me, I guess I'll call you Orms is what I added on the end there, because that's what he's saying in the, in the mirror, I'm a loser, nobody mm-hmm. likes me. He's find out that he's a private detective. Then we meet Jimmy Dix, Dick Dick Wayans, who... He throws a pretty good spiral. He hits him right in the nose and breaks his nose. He could start for the Bears tomorrow. Um, <laughs> if the Bengals need a quarterback. <laughs> hey, that guy deserved everything that he got. He was try- He was legitimately going to kill that woman. Yeah. We find good guy Jimmy Dix. He comes out and sees that after an NFL party where NFL players are, as is one of the things I'm going to talk about in my closing thoughts, that night, early 90s movies do not age well. Mm-hmm. Where they have all these women at this party and this man is just trying to drown this woman in the hot tub. Yeah. So then back at the Hallenbeck home, Joe comes home, cleaning his gun, sitting on the end of his bed, talking about his promiscuous daughter. His daughter, how she wears so much makeup, she looks like a raccoon. She's like 13. <laughs> <laughs> She's I a know. Puppet. I know. <laughs> And it's amazing. He's sitting there complaining about his daughter, what he thinks is bad in 1991, you know, with his daughter, the Satanist, you know, or Satan Claus or whatever the picture was drawn. (laughs) The whole time he's doing it, his wife's hiding her lover in the closet. And we find out that uh, apparently that job for 500 bucks, it was... It was just to get him out of the house. His, I mean, his great detective skills of noticing that the shower was running and the toilet seat is up. That just proves I mean, he's a detective, okay? He he is a detective. (laughs) Sarah, 
how did you not know I'm not a detective? You wouldn't you think that I would know these things? The real kicker in this scene for me is when he pulls the gun out and he shoots the wedding picture. That's still assault. Like, <laughs> <laughs> still shot something. I, I think what I, the most of what I learned from this scene is that his wife has a thing for mustache. <laughs> More fat guys. <laughs> This does have one of the best lines of the movie where he's expl- Joe is explaining to his friend Mike like, how it was an accident. He must have just slipped. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he just <laughs> fell into my wife. Well, then he takes him outside and says, like, you want it in the head or the gut? And he, you know, because that's how then they just bury it. Like, everything's okay. Yeah, he punches him and he's like, hey, so tell me more about this $500 job. And he's <laughs> I like, still wow. need the $500. So it, <laughs> yeah, like, so, so it just costs 500 bucks to bone your wife. Okay. Yeah, you know, good to know. <laughs> of course, when Mike goes gets in his car, it explodes in typical great Tony Scott fashion, which was volume to the max. <laughs> like, I, I, you're like, of so, course, of course, it explodes because everyone's car in the ninety just exploded. You just got in your car and it just exploded, so, and you you survived it somehow, though. <laughs> and this is where my confusion starts. Then there goes the five hundred bucks, right? Who's going to pay him the five hundred bucks? Was he going to get it from from Mike? But no, no, no. The job continues. The job must go on. It doesn't matter if Mike is blown up in the smithereens. Uh, there's still boobs to be protected. I'm sorry. I mean, a woman to be protected. Um, he's a detective. He needs to figure out who killed his friend slash guy who was boning his wife on the side. And also, he needs the five hundred dollars. So yeah, but he's just, at the heart. He's a detective. He needs to figure this out. <laughs> he can't just go back. I, to I guess it can't hurt that <laughs> that it requires him to hang out at a strip club. In the least, you see some boobs. Like. <laughs> Well, at that strip club slash bar, we see boobs. We, huh? we also get some more backstory on that Jimmy is it's dating a douchebag. Corey, <laughs> but it's also one to cheat on her because that's his role is to just have sex with anything that has a pulse. Yeah, he's like his friends, like you cheated on her again. What is wrong with you? Like because he's just pounding back the drinks because he feels so guilty that he cheated on her. And then at the same- right. she's not going to live much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, more backstory. Joe was meeting with Corey, and we find out that there's some unpleasant people who are following her, but we don't know why. But she gets distracted by their back and forth that she almost misses her time on stage for the three people that are in that strip club. <laughs> Come on, people. Raise the excitement here. It's Halle Berry as a stripper. Yeah, I Everyone know. Everyone should be in there. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying. Like, I know. Who has to follow this her? <laughs> She she would definitely be the hottest stripper versus probably any strip club I've ever been to. I think um, she's like the know. hottest stripper anyone's ever seen. I mean, <laughs> I've seen the strippers. <laughs> they need some help. <laughs> so, of course, Jimmy, feeling sorry for cheating on Corey, even though he has to have sex with him, has a heartbeat. He goes over to talk to Joe, go to set the record straight. And this see is, who he is, yeah. This is actually great because Joe, the whole time, is like, listen, why don't you just throw a punch? Because <laughs> yeah. I think you're weak. Yeah. I don't have to tell you anything. And then he finally does. And Joe embarrasses him so bad by catching the punch and throwing him on the ground. It is. It could not have gone worse for Jimmy. He's it's a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely one of those situations in which someone who thinks Jimmy thinks bigger and stronger. Obviously, I should win this fight when it's like where you actually go up against someone who's been who actually has somewhat training in fighting. Like, it goes horribly wrong very quickly. The biggest takeaway I get from this... the biggest we find out later that Bruce is a former Secret Service agent. Yeah, that's like the thread in this movie that I really like, actually, that he has this other history where he protected the senator, and when he heard something was going wrong, he went in and took care of business, that he also protected the president. Like, actually, I really like that thread that's through this whole movie. Okay, but by protecting the president... (laughs) I think we need to address this. He protected the president because he just took a bullet. Like, he didn't, like, catch anything. He wasn't, like, a detective, and he didn't, like, catch it before it happened. <laughs> he just literally threw his body. <laughs> he was in the right place at the right time to throw his body. He did a good job of getting shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very so good at getting shot. Yeah, so everyone's like, he, he saved the president. Like, yeah, because he used his body, not because he was, like, he foiled the plan. They still shot him. They still shot him. <laughs> I think saving the president is making it so that it doesn't actually happen. Like, I caught it before it happened. I figured out this plan was going to happen. You're awful critical of saving the president. (laughs) I'm just saying. Expect him to do all the, like, legwork and stuff. Like, solving everything before he's got... 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure have Secret not, Service is pretty much seen just those White House away. Down movies. <laughs> like, I, I think that's like the whole whole point of Secret Service, just just kind of get in the way of it. But have you not seen those White House Down movies? <laughs> or the what, what's the other Very one? True. Olympus has fallen. <laughs> Gerard mm-hmm. Butler, he saves everybody and he figures stuff out before it happens. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. He saved all of London. <laughs> <laughs> so which the biggest takeaway for me in this whole scene is seeing that jimmy dix is essentially ryan lee oh yeah that's really what he is <laughs> he's addicted to drugs he's slimy he Washed steals up. things <laughs> probably goes to see strippers underperformed on the field <laughs> underperformed everywhere else in life <laughs> outside when joe sees the billboard and has this flashback moment he then gets knocked down and carried away by some thugs melissa i believe in our chat while we were watching this movie this is also when you said an unrealistic expectation that strippers look like Halle Berry and not like tara reed i just wanted to make sure that got mentioned <laughs> <laughs> I said an old Tara Reed, okay? For the record, talking like Sharknado Tara Reed. <laughs> Corey and Jimmy leave. He's saying that he will just bitch slap anyone. Bitch slap who anybody. Will, yeah, well, you're in a separate car. How do you bitch slap them? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Joe was telling his wife to sell fat jokes and then stabbing his way out of trouble. Hey, those are some funny jokes, though. <laughs> of course, the best way to protect someone when they're in danger and driving their own car is that you drive in your car behind them. That Two way car if, lengths behind them. That way, if something happens, you're there. You can witness it. Kind of like someone driving home drunk and you just follow them in your car. <laughs> exactly. Don't ever try to save me that way, Dominic. <laughs> I'll follow behind you two car lengths. <laughs> I'll just get to witness it. Oh, and, and they make it too easy. The hitman hits the bumper of the Corvette. And it's a Corvette. Those bumpers are, aren't cheap. Of course she's going to pull over. <laughs> she pulls over, gets out. They jump out. They waste her with a machine gun. They go like, so job's over, right? No 500 bucks. There's no one to pay Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't need it anymore. <laughs> you, you failed at your security job, right? He should have got the. She wanted to give him the, the money in advance. He was apparently, like, no, just though, wait. <laughs> apparently the movie goes on. The movie right there. <laughs> I, I, I thought the movie was over. She's yeah. dead. <laughs> he failed. <laughs> and what makes it worse, cops show up and they treat it like it's just your average stripper murder. Everyone can go. <laughs> they, even, they don't even like harass Joe. They show up, there's all these people dead, shot dead. Jimmy has run over someone in his car. The police have no idea what was happening, but. Joe, he's cool. Don't worry about him. Let's go investigate the other people. Well, because he's an ex-CIA. <laughs> Secret <laughs> Service. That, that's, and that's when we find out. Police chief says he's free to go. And he, he, the guy, the one of the other cops is like, hey, why is he free to go? And he's like, hey, he was Secret Service. He saved we'll give you a lot of background. Until a senator <laughs> got him fired. Saying a lot of background for just like a, a passing moment that's going on between two people. <laughs> that is a brutal know, scene too yeah. with Baynard where he has that flashback to see like what he went in. Yeah, and what the hell was he doing? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, it's like something out of eight millimeter. <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh-huh. So back at Corey's house, of course, they go, it's I mean it's in the morning. They they stay it all night at the at the precinct. They're being investigated by the police, they get released, everything's fine. They, they're not charged with anything. They leave, they go straight over to Corey's house, and Jimmy has to go with Joe because he's the only one that knows how to get past the security system because he installed it himself it's pretty high tech and they get there he just kicks in the door and everything's fine but when they get in they realize they're not the first ones there yeah the place of has course been trashed also you realize that jimmy only went because he wanted to find his drugs mm-hmm. his drugs and he says oh by the way i also found this this is probably what they were looking for this tape and this picture uh by the way did you know that Corey was dating uh Mar- Mar- marcone that they were a thing for a long time and she was a cheerleader for the team <sighs> and like all that stuff. Hey, like, it tur- just to, to help make the story make sense. <laughs> not, not just that. Like, it turns out Corey had this whole life we didn't know about. She had this whole blackmail scam going on with the pictures and the recordings and everything. Apparently, her and Jimmy were trying to get some cash out of McCone. <laughs> so, or at least, uh, uh, I mean, unless Jimmy's pretending not to know about it. My favorite thing in this scene is that in every moment, Jimmy's like, that's Marcone. And Joe's like, I know. And yeah, like, like, he looks at the picture like, that's Marcone right there. It's like, I know. They play the tape. And he's like, that's Marcone like, talking. I know. <laughs> like, I know. And, and I love, they play the tape. And, and then he, he, he's like, boring. He hits fast forward. He's like, don't hit fast forward. It eats the tape. Everybody who had, a, <laughs> who had a tape deck and in I'm their car. And I'm thinking in my head. 
Yeah, I'm thinking in my head, like, this is so early 90s problems because no one's going to understand. Your kids are not going to understand what that scene means. It's going to eat the tape. Like, no, no. one... Like, no, that is no so way. Tape deck problems are so problems of the past. <laughs> Everyone listening to this show right now, raise your hands if you have a pencil in the door of your car because it fixed your tapes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's nighttime now, though. Because they were at Corey's house all day. Apparently. It's nighttime when they go to leave and some thugs come up to come talk to them. Luckily, before the thugs came, Joe realized that Corey had two cars and that the other car was probably set to blow up. So he goes and rescues Jimmy. Pulls the C4 out and puts it into his trunk when the thugs show up. These two thugs are harassing them and they go is to open the trunk rather than opening it. He shoots it. Because they threw the key. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you you got to give it. So Joe puts the C4 in the lock and closes the trunk. And then they ask for the key and Joe throws them like five feet away. <laughs> and rather than walk five feet away and pick up yeah. the keys and open the trunk, True. they think they'll be all cool and just shoot the lock, which is pretty smart thinking for Joe to know that they were going to be dumb enough to not walk five feet and pick up the keys. <laughs> he knew they were going to be lazy. And because of that, they shot the lock and blew up and they're able to jump down a ravine or something to safety. Yeah, it's, it's more evidence that Joe is actually a pretty good cop. He, he can read the situation around him and be able to like move things around to fit the way that he wants it to be. But he sure spends a lot of time having to explain himself in the police office to the chief of police. And the chief of police is not having mm -hmm. any of it. He also gets a lot of time getting punched. <laughs> 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 I mean, he's a tough guy in this movie, but he gets punched a lot. Like, <laughs> they keep hitting him. <laughs> he's like, will you stop hitting me? <laughs> So now we take this brief stop over at Bruce's house. This is where we meet his kid, who I kind of like his kid. She's, she's kind of sassy, even though she's a little weird with the whole cat doll. She lays some amazing truth bombs on Jimmy. She just, I mean, she eviscerates him to the point where he's like, I'm going to go in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I love, got the, his jersey, his high school number tattooed like on his head or something. And she's like, oh, that's cool. When do you graduate? <laughs> oh, like, oh burn. she also says it was the number four so they can identify you when you lose it, that way you can find your head <laughs> i guess i'm the only one that thought she was just super annoying <laughs> maybe because that's I'm a, I'm a mom if that was my daughter i'd just be smacking her around <laughs> i love darian and when she comes back around later she's the only person that can actually do anything <laughs> Jimmy is useless. Yeah, they should have had Darian on that horse on the field <laughs> at the end of the movie. <laughs> this is where they try and tie like the whole Boy Scout thing. Jimmy sees a picture of Joe with the president. Says, oh, I bet you, you've always been a Boy Scout. He even throws out a little mention of, of the only time he's taken a picture like that is with a cutout of Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> After the argument between dad and daughter, which is brutal. Yeah, they, that's a bad argument. They use some very colorful language when talking to each other. Well, mostly her. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Darian storms out after Sarah comes out because she says, I heard mom telling Uncle Jimmy or no, whatever his name somebody, is. No, somebody yeah. else. It wasn't, not the guy she cheated with, like her, no. uh, yeah, her actual uncle. Yeah, yeah, her actual uncle that Sarah was saying that Joe was no good. He can't provide for the family. And Joe is very hurt by that. And that's exactly when Sarah comes walking into the room. And Darian's like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> then they take a quick break. They catch their breath. Jimmy has a moment to say his backstory about his wife being run over by a truck while she was eight months pregnant. Which was really sad, by the way. <laughs> yes. Yes, he got It was really sad, but it didn't really have anything to do with the movie before or after he tells us this. Well, it's supposed to be why. It's like it's supposed to lead to why he's addicted to drugs and like why he went down that path and why he's not playing like why he's not a quarterback anymore that's what that's that's that was the whole point of that whole thing he says he's gonna yeah, go take a I, shower okay. and then joe comes in and sees him that he's doing some coke and flushes a thousand dollars worth of cocaine in the, down the toilet mm -hmm. and that's when jimmy goes into this huge tirade about always being hurt and the mm -hmm. league taking advantage of him and having a dead and how wife like and he he had the best game of his life the night that she died because he, she wasn't there because she couldn't travel because she was too pregnant to travel. And so he mm -hmm. and his son basically lived for 17 minutes without him while he was playing that game. But Joe does not give a shit about any of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and he comes in and punches Jimmy. Uh, I, punches I was Joe. <laughs> <laughs> 
and tells him to get out. Jimmy grabs his stuff, heads out on the porch. That's when Darian, waiting for him, says, hey, actually, you know, my dad really likes you. I actually it. know who you are, yeah, and I, I want you to sign my card. Can you, can you sign this for me? And by the way, my dad loved you. And when you were done, he stopped watching football. It's like a Kajana Carter moment. <laughs> <laughs> Can we also address that Joe's kind of a hypocrite because he's like, get out of my house. You know, you're doing drugs. But he's totally an alcoholic, right? That's why he was drunk yeah. with a squirrel in his face. But in, in 1991, earlier. in 1991, alcohol was not considered a drug. He was, it was okay to be an alcoholic as long as you didn't do drugs. <laughs> so I want to get to this this next scene which is one of my favorite scenes because the bad guys are going to catch up to Jimmy Dix by himself and they are going to catch him while he's driving and they're going to pull him out of a car and throw him over an overpass, which only turns out to be like 15, 20 feet and he lands on a car and he's like, okay, (laughs) completely anticlimactic. First you think, oh no, they caught up to him. They're going to kill him because they're (laughs) trying to kill him, right? He has dirt on their boss. They're hitmen. They're supposed to kill him. Instead of killing him, they just decide to rough him up a little bit. They just throw him 10 feet down. Like, yeah, take that. They look really disappointed, too, when he falls and he survives. And there's also, like, there's a lot of people down there. It's like, dude, it's L.A. You threw him off an overpass. <laughs> yeah. Did you think you were going to throw him over the edge and then, go, and then be able to go down there and it was going to be, like, empty? <laughs> yeah. At least they could have waited until he got to a taller overpass before they decided to grab him. <laughs> I also love that Jimmy, when they come up to Jimmy, like, what do you guys want? And they're just staring at him. He's like, I'm trying to decide which one of you looks more like my dick. And I'm like, it's clearly the dude on the left. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he looks like <laughs> this. <laughs> Pablo. Pablo? Is it Pablo? At the precinct, the cops think they figured out that why Joe has been at the scene of all these is because he actually killed Mike. Found out that his wife was cheating on him and that's he killed Mike and there's all these other things. Can't be coincidence. Joe has to be behind it. Back at Joe's house, Joe is having a morning moment where he's seeing his beautiful wife and he's saying goodbye to his daughter and he's realizing why he does it all. He does it all just for them. And he steps out on his porch and gets cattle prodded. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the scene where we get the kidnappers, Frank. And, and this mm-hmm. is a great scene. They're like taunting him and like trying to beat him up. And Joe's basically, he just threatens him once. Hey, you hit me again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And so he hits him again. And he kills him, but he kills, like, one shot right to the nose and, like, puts it right into his skull. And, like, yeah. the other hitman, instead of reacting, like, shooting him or anything, he's almost impressed. So he's like, holy <laughs> crap, you killed him with one punch. He was very upset. He's like, he's killed him. He killed him. When Milo comes and the in, other guy comes in and can care less, too. He's like, whatever. Like, yeah, so what? He killed him. <laughs> this is also when Marcone comes in. It just says, heck, here's my entire evil plan. <laughs> Let me play yes. it out for you while <laughs> I swim. What is Scooby Doo villain? <laughs> <laughs> so, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to swim in my pool, and I'm going to tell you all about my plans. <laughs> it goes into a tirade about how free agency is ruining the game, and about greedy players are, are asking yeah, for greedy money players in his private pool room with his <laughs> thugs. <laughs> you know what's funny, too? This would be about four or five years after the NFL strike. So I wonder if like this was actually a sentiment at the time. There's actually a few times in the movie. There's one time in the police parking garage where a cop pulls up and s- says he recognizes Jimmy. And he thinks he's some other criminal and jimmy says no, i'm a football player and he says we agency killed the game and he drives away they really mm-hmm. wanted you to know that in this movie <laughs> tony <laughs> yeah, scott did uh, not uh, believe I... in free agency <laughs> <laughs> so marcone's plan is they're gonna frame joe which they already did frame him of killing one police officer yes. they're gonna frame him to kill baynard because baynard, he hates baynard baynard wants six million dollars from marcone to pass this legalized ga- sports gambling thing marcone says it's cheaper just to kill him so let's just kill him and keep the six million dollars, and then we'll also be, be able to get rid of him, be able to get rid of this block to our path to legalize sports gambling. I mean, he's not wrong. You just get rid of him. <laughs> but wait, he wait, wouldn't wait. be this, right? I have he's a, a question, terrible though. person. <laughs> now it may be cheaper to get rid of him, but is it cheaper to get rid of him and Jimmy? And Joe and the stripper. Yeah, I know. Um, who, that's a lot. Do these are these hitmen charging per job or per kill? Are they per, per hour? Pound. What is their per diem? Do they get a food budget? This might not actually be cheaper, guys. Real fast at the precinct, Sarah and Jimmy are testifying. Joe didn't kill any cops, but the cops aren't really believing them. 
Darian's there with her puppet. A Weirdo. Puppet's, yeah, this puppet's going to be important later. Weirdo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Jimmy calls a friend and finds out where Baynard's place is because he's going to follow Baynard. He gets there. Darian shows up there, too, with her puppet. Gets in the car with Jimmy to go along on the ride while they investigate Baynard. It just happens to be that Baynard's going to a meeting with Marcone out in the woods, which is like a seven-hour drive from Los Angeles. So... <laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> they have a pretty thorough setup here. They're going to take pictures of Joe dealing this briefcase to Baynard's henchman or his, mm -hmm. his security detail. But that security detail also is going to get a bomb. They're going to take that bomb to the game. And at the stadium, it's going to blow up the entire suite that has Baynard and all his staff inside of it. And the briefcase will have Joe's fingerprints on it because he's the one who they forced him to hand it over and then took a picture of a man in it over. And he's got a history with Baynard yeah, and so and it all he's makes already sense. Been, he's been this is, prank this, calling him for years. <laughs> and this is an enormously elaborate way to go about this considering they have Joe's gun and they can just shoot everybody and then yeah, go shoot the senator with Joe's gun. <laughs> the cops are already suspicious of Joe for killing <laughs> the guy was that was saying. nailing his wife. And this is when the movie gets really good. This is when this movie delivers. The opening, great. We have all this build up. It is kind of a slow burn. There's some action sequences here and there. But this is typical Tony Scott fashion, which is backstory, build, 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 Explode. build. And then when you get to the end, there's this crazy crap happens. Because now, they have to somehow escape the woods. They have to stop this briefcase from being delivered to the stadium and killing all kinds of innocent people at the stadium. Including Boehner. They have to take down Marcone. There's all these henchmen that are trying to hunt them at the same time. And the police. And the police that are trying to hunt them too. So it's all coming to a head. And this is why this movie then delivers right at the very end. This is when Darian comes walking up with her puppet. No one's going to shoot a kid. Apparently she knows that, right? Now with a puppet, they might. And think she's, she's got the puppet <laughs> stuffed inside of there. Gives it to her dad. Dad starts telling jokes with the puppet. Uses it to shoot. I would say, boy, boy, this movie would have a different feel if someone was willing to shoot a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Michael <My God. laughs> took a major twist at the end there. <laughs> Shot that puppet right in the head. <laughs> this is because Darian is a badass. She just or she's an idiot. Up, she just walks up, gun placed in the puppet already, lets her dad tell a couple jokes like we know he does. Mm -hmm. He's kind of a jokester. Then he starts shooting. Jimmy's able to get his hands on a gun. They're able to shoot their way out of it and get into a car, which leads into a chase through the dirt roads in the L.A. Hills, I guess. Is where yeah, I think it's supposed to be like the, L.A., like Hollywood. Like in, the, in the Hollywood Hills, which ends in a car careening off a cliff into a pool. In the someone's backyard. Not only does the car explode, but the pool catches on. Like, literally the water <laughs> catches on fire. Which, if your pool water catches on fire, you're using too much bleach. You need to back off. <laughs> he even shoots into the car a few times to make sure that everyone is dead. Then decides that I'm going to leave Darian here with this person. This random guy in his backyard with his uh -huh. dog. We're going to steal his Andy car Victor. after faking looking to shoot his daughter to get his car and they just take off to go race to the stadium to stop this explosion from happening but and guys would you guess what the stranger did not do a good enough do job protecting his daughter and the bad guys were able to get her <laughs> also that poor guy Turns was just out. in his backyard having coffee and now he's dead <laughs> i know how, how, how rip -off. Day is that jimmy and joe are meanwhile giving chase to banner's bodyguards who are in a bulletproof limo but they're able to and run we're it. And we're learning that Jimmy is terrible at pictograms. <laughs> or <laughs> spelling. <laughs> drawing apples with lines coming from it, which is apparently a bomb. <laughs> Not a bomb. A bomb. <laughs> they are able to stop the limo. He has to kill one of the bodyguards, too. He's just forced into doing it. You can see, too, he doesn't like it. And they get the briefcase, which I guess that means he gets both the briefcases, right? This is where they get it. One one has $6 million in it. The other one has a bomb yep. in it, right? And they also get some weapons with shotgun with exploding bullets because that becomes important later. Milo survived. He has Darian. He calls and says that he's taking Darian and delivering, like, deliver the money to the senator or to Marcone, and then you will get Darian back. So now it's all coming together. That All of this has to get done at the stadium. Now, at a live game at the stadium. They show up. Jimmy and Joe just kind of waltz right in the back. Because it's like, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the guy trying to kill that 
woman in the very beginning in the hot tub, he gets a gun pulled on him, decides he's not so tough anymore. But point to that no one is paying attention to what Jimmy and Joe are doing. They're able to just do whatever the yeah, hell they just want walk to. Right through. No one is paying attention <laughs> oh, to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. They just show up, and there's like, apparently, there's no security at this football game. They go into Marcone's office, surrounded by guards. Marcone says that Milo is going to sniper the senator from an, a quote, enlightened place, and that he wants his money. And their plan, Jimmy and Joe have this plan on how it's going to go down, but apparently, it does not go that way right after. Jimmy gets his hand shot off. <laughs> right, a bullet right through the hand, yeah. So, but can we talk about how the owner, this indecisive NFL owner, his plan has changed. So rather than blow him up, blow the senator up, now he's going to shoot him. And he's got this guy up there with a gun. Well, okay, so the bomb's out. So now we're going to shoot him. How did they plan all these different ways to kill the senator? <laughs> <laughs> and still fail at it. Their trick is supposed to be that they're the only ones that know where the $6 million is, and that's why you have to let all of them go, but that's not going to work out. He tries to blackmail them into saying that if you tell me the tapes and the information about you controlling the gambling aren't going to go to the media, they're going to go to the mob, which is actually a great play. Like, the mob yeah, is because they're gonna be gambling, more, yeah. and yeah, they're, they're going to take that very personally. He did look like he was scared mm -hmm. when he said that. He but also mentions when... that the uh, money happens to be in, uh, the suitcase with the money happens to be in their white BMW, which obviously is a trick because that would be the bomb. You know, just leave the money in the trunk of a white BMW. And the, the bomb in the front seat to everyone can see it. <laughs> None of that gets them away from this. But actually gets them out, comes back to that exploding shell. Jimmy throws it into the fireplace. It explodes. Shootout. Jimmy and Joe, somehow against all odds, outnumbered like 10 to 1, are able to escape. Ex so is Marcone. Those exploding bullets are no joke, man. That guy like legitly went up in flames. He like melted. <laughs> Marcone's able to get out and he gets all the way out to his car and sees the white BMW reaches into the passenger seat and grabs that briefcase and then leaves. So that's that's where Marcone is at right now. Jimmy and Joe know that someone is, or Milo, is out there to sniper the senator, and they don't want any innocent people to get hurt, and they want to save Vayner for whatever reason. Instead of just letting him get shot and then catch Milo, maybe that'll work out better. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Jimmy's going to try and save the senator by stealing a horse, riding into the middle of the field on the horse, <laughs> stealing the football, and drilling the senator in the face with the football right at the exact moment that Milo is about to shoot the senator in the head. And meanwhile, while this is all taking on, Joe is somehow running through all of the stadium, past all the lines for the bathrooms and to get beer and through all the people <laughs> and all the way up through all the restricted areas, up onto the scoreboard with Milo. This is why we love these movies. This is so ridiculous, yet so much fun when it gets to the end. Even though it's high stakes, right? Yeah. It's still fun. Jimmy gets on a horse and rides <laughs> it out into the field and then throws it from like the 50-yard line yeah, into, them, yeah. Yeah, into one of the luxury oh, yeah. boots. That is a heave. Yeah. That is far. Yeah, that's that's him and Patrick Mahomes. They're the only two people in the world who can make that throw. <laughs> from a horse. <laughs> But it's so much fun. And then he tries to get people to get their attention. And he rides the horse away. We have no background. But Jimmy knows how to ride a horse. Also, can you imagine being at that game? Like being a player, being a referee? Like what do you what do you call on that? There's a horse on the field. Oh, yeah. Imagine being a fan. This is all going on. Some random guy runs out, steals a horse, rides into there, throws the football, hits someone in the press box. Immediately <laughs> after that, a guy is shot on the scoreboard, falls. <laughs> And a guy a helicopter blade <laughs> and is cut up by the helicopter blade. And then the guy, <laughs> one of the guys who shot him, starts doing a jig on the scoreboard. <laughs> it is chaos. And they are successful in that scene of Milo falling from the scoreboard after being shot like 50 times because Joe doesn't actually shoot him. The other police shoot him. Yeah. Then he falls off the scoreboard and then into the, hel the police For helicopter. Measure. <laughs> yeah, just want to make sure. Uh -huh. one, remember, he survived that crash into the pool, upside down in the pool. He's dead, though. We yeah. got him. He's good. We, we got, got him. him. I'm just saying, man, are you not entertained? This is going to generate so many Cialis commercials. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to sit in so many bathtubs in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> this is why these movies are great. 
And then we get to the end, we have the diehard ending, which is like all the police are there and people are wandering out of the stadium. And Joe's in the parking lot yelling, oh, hey, I mean, <laughs> Sarah. And he finally finds her. But in, in the opposite of a diehard moment, they hug. And he's like, fuck you, Sarah. <laughs> fucking oh, hate oh, you. Oh. And that's supposed to be the endearing moment in Because this movie. she said that. She goes, sometimes I just wish you would just say, fuck you, Sarah. I fucking hate you. You ruined my life. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And then and then you see Mercone. He's back at the house. And he opens up the briefcase just in time to blow up. Which is actually sad. Because it blows his two dogs up, too. And I'm like, what did the dogs do? I like, knew I you were going to say but... that. I knew it. I was like, John's going to bring up the dogs blew up. I was, I, I thought that, but... too. I'm like, oh, the dogs. They didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. They there. didn't do nothing wrong. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably, they were good dogs. But you can see the explosion from the arena. And everyone looks at each other. At back, at, Jimmy looks at Joe and Sarah. And they all look at each other. And then they do the whole like laugh freeze frame type <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, he's dead. Ah, we got him. We blew him up. Yeah, and then, so, and then Jimmy tries to tell the story get, about he's like, oh, that he must have got the wrong briefcase. That's what happened. <laughs> and then we jump to the final scene where they're like hanging out as pals at his house. And I immediately wonder, did anyone ever pay him the five hundred dollars? <laughs> like was, was all of this for nothing? It's just this is why Tony Scott is great. Because it was a slow burn until we got to the very end, but then this chaos. And it went into high gear. <laughs> yeah, it just ensues in this sprint to the very end of the movie. And you're left with a lot of heroes, but they're not the best people, but they did the right thing. Yeah, and... no, they're all shitty people. <laughs> Let's get that straight. <laughs> they did the right, I mean, Jimmy cheats on his girlfriend. Joe's okay. He's just, you know, he's just lost and sad, but <laughs> <laughs> not really. He's not the greatest father. I mean, you know. <laughs> But it's totally because it's a Shane Black script, too, that this is, well, what if we were to make a slightly more adult version of Lethal Weapon, but had John McClane as, yeah. the, as the lead instead of Riggs? Yeah. And yeah, Mel Gibson. what if we had a whoring coke addict <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of Murtaugh? Murtaugh. <laughs> I think it was supposed to be like a younger, cooler Murtaugh, but yeah, I get your point. <laughs> no one is younger and cooler than Danny Glover. <laughs> I don't care if he is old. No, <laughs> Danny Glover was old in 1989. I love so. Danny Glover. <laughs> Uh, and that's the end of this movie. And, uh, it, you know, we poked a lot of fun at it, building all up to the very end. And then the end is just fucking amazing. And that's why we watched this movie. And we yeah, still poked fun at it. It's, no. it's, the end, it's just amazing. The scene alone where he falls into the blades of the helicopter is so worth it. That's it's great amazing. being shredded up. <laughs> <laughs> all those Over people the top in the of crowd, <laughs> Which makes me wonder, where did the helicopter... Oh, and... So, and we didn't even touch on this, and I just have to throw it out there. So, the helicopter is apparently a SWAT helicopter. But for whatever reason, the SWAT helicopter is there. And Milo, the hitman guy, he takes out the guy who's shooting at him from the helicopter on both sides of the helicopter. <laughs> what are because like, don't, you don't see it, but like both guys must be hanging from that helicopter dead <laughs> at the moment <laughs> that they shoot Milo. Who then falls into the helicopter. And so it's like utter chaos in the stadium. <laughs> there are dead SWAT guys hanging from a SWAT helicopter. Bloodshot <laughs> shooting everywhere. And there's a guy doing a jig. <laughs> it's just, it's so great. It's so great. And and, and going to get more into it in my final thoughts. Which I don't want to give away too much of that as we wrap up the movie here uh, so let's go talk about the music that is in this movie and this is different from last week last week had a legit soundtrack where they commissioned a whole bunch of songs this one's a little bit different and it's different from what we ever experienced in vice too so let's go break down this week's music all right john as i mentioned this one's a little bit different because this is a movie soundtrack but movie soundtrack as in music that was made for the movie not to chart what do you got for us this week? This week, our music's a little different in that, it, you know, we're talking about maybe five songs. Apparently, they didn't have, like, a soundtrack that they were going to try and sell. So they just had a couple songs that were kind of made for the movie. So, but let's start out with the obvious, Friday Night's a Great Night for Football. Because Friday Night's a Great Night for Football. <laughs> and it was written by Steve Dorff and, and John Bettis. And it was performed by Bill Medley. Now, I know what you're thinking. Not that Bill Medley. Not the Bill Medley from the Righteous Brothers. Composer Bill Medley 
who did a bunch of soundtrack work, including movies like Cobra and Dirty Dancing and Rambo 3. He also had a song on the Major League soundtrack and then a ton of soundtrack work for TV. Now, Bill Medley, he was a career composer, soundtrack guy, music department. Um, I am, you know, uh, but Steve Dorff and John Bettis were two of the most accomplished damn songwriters. Steve Dorff wrote songs for artists, mostly country artists, including Clay Walker, George Strait, Lee Greenwood, and Kenny Rogers. Damn. By the way, Steve Dorff and John Bettis both together wrote the theme to the sitcom Growing Pains. I remember that song. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Dorff has won three Grammys and five Emmys. Some pretty accomplished people brought in to write the Friday Night's A Great Night for Football song. Which, on a side note, the only words in that song are Friday Night is in fact a great night for football. <laughs> Those are the only words. It's the same verse over and over and over again for being such accomplished songwriters. Didn't work very hard on this one, guys. <laughs> Our next song is Moody River, which is written by Gary Bruce, but performed by Pat Boone in 1961. <laughs> so Pat Boone is an American singer and composer, actor, writer, TV personality, motivational speaker, and just all around old person. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he is. He is. He's a quintessential old person. He was a successful pop singer in the 50s and 60s. And at one point in time, he had so he sold over 45 million records and was like second to only Elvis, in, you know, as far as the biggest charting artist in the 50s. He had 38 top 40 hits. He appeared in 12 films. But as a conservative Christian, he turned down a number of risque roles, including ones that involved uh, more risque sexual actresses like Marilyn Monroe. Yes, he turned down movies with Marilyn Monroe <laughs> because she was too sexy. Too much. It was too much that dress. I don't go around I don't go around sexualized women because you can't trust them, right? You know, it's them that you can't trust. Can't, it's not you. You can't be in them. that movie with that woman. They, they show her ankles. <laughs> I did not think that was where it was going. I'm like, oh my God. So <laughs> I guess his biggest movie would probably be Journey to the Center of the Earth in 1959. And he, mind you, he, he is a gigantic, he was a gigantic pop star and uh, actor from that time. And then as he has gotten older, he has just become a very, now he's old. <laughs> uh, a very vocal conservative Republican and very much the face of the religious right. And uh, old person. He pretty much just embodies that old person. So uh, apparently he's really into basketball, too. He was the majority owner of the ABA's Oakland Oaks, which were originally supposed to be called the Oakland Americans. Uh, but apparently uh, America sued that. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Apparently, uh, Oakland's not that American, so they had to be the Oak. But From what I... 67 to 69, but eventually he had this team was in such financial ruin, he had to sell it to a D.C. businessman, and they became the Washington Capitals and eventually the Virginia Squares. <laughs> squires. Squires, not squares. Sorry. Although I... the squares would have probably been a better name. I love that, how you're describing Pat Boone, that it makes it sound like that if you were to look up Baby Boom. There's just a picture of Pat Boone. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he looks like, too, for the record. If you've ever seen Pat Boone, he's just like an old... He, lo <laughs> he always looks like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> and that, hey, I'm just calling it like I see it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> well, biologist, I just call it like I see it. <laughs> I mean, come on. The religious Bing Crosby? Is that a thing? <laughs> Jesus Christ, what was Bing so, Crosby up to? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, he was I, I don't know how else to describe Pat Boone. <laughs> except he's that guy that your grandma in, in invites over from church. <laughs> Our next song is Tusk, which is written by Lindsey Buckingham. And Lindsey Buckingham is best known as the lead guitarist and one of the vocalists from the group Fleetwood Mac. Mm. So guys, 
Fleetwood sure. Mac has actually been a group since the 60s, but uh, shortly after Peter Green would leave the group, they would be looking for a vocal presence and a guitarist, and they would bring in Lindsey Buckingham. And so from 75 to 87, and then again from 97 to 18, to 2018, Buckingham would be would be in Fleetwood Mac. But more importantly than Buckingham being in Fleetwood Mac, is that his main stipulation to joining the group was that he insisted they include his musical and romantic partner Stevie Nicks. Mm, that worked out. So thanks, thanks to Buckingham. <laughs> thanks for that, huh? Stevie, <laughs> yeah, thanks to Buckingham, they had to include Stevie Nicks. And so, and actually, that is the most famous era of Fleetwood Mac is the Buckingham Nicks era. The group would sell over forty million with their album Rumors. They would blow up in that seventy-five to eighty-seven time. Eventually, Lindsay would leave in 87 to pursue his own solo career. He'd release a few albums, but eventually get back together after a 1993 performance at Bill Clinton's inaugural ball. And from 97 to 2018, he would record with the band. In 18, he would be fired from the band. On a side note, his brother Gregory won a silver medal at the uh, 1968 Olympic. I do appreciate so. that for in Fleetwood Mac. That in 1975, they were like, listen, this we got to change things up here. We got to get a new lead singer. And Mick Fleetwood was like, I can do that. And they're like, no, no. we got to go. <laughs> then in 1987, when Lindsay and Stevie are like, listen, we're out. We're, we're going to go do our own soul stuff. We need a new lead singer. And Mick Fleetwood was like, I can do it. Like, oh, no, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and let's just be honest. There is no era without Stevie Nicks for Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, I like, know. What they were doing before, I don't know. But they were not making the music like they were making with her. <laughs> so, as a as I Fleetwood Mac fan. I the Peter King era, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, our next song is I Want to Be a Cowboy, written by Brian Chatton, Nico Ramsden, Nick Richards, and Jeff Siaparty, and performed by Boys Don't Cry. Now, guess what, guys? All those people I mentioned as the writers, they make up Boys Don't Cry. Mm. When bands do this, it always makes me imagine. I always imagine them writing songs like some big long Mad Lib. Like Brian <laughs> writes a word, and then Nico writes a word, and then Nick <laughs> writes a word. <laughs> it's just one big long Mad Lib. <laughs> Long story short, Boys Don't Cry was a British pop rock band known for this exact song, I Want to Be a Cowboy. It made it to number 12 on the Hot 100 list in 1986. The band formed in 83 by Richards, who was the uh, vocalist and keyboardist, and he formed it after he had purchased Maison Rogue Record Studio in London. And so it definitely... It helps in getting a record contract and to start a band when you own your own record studio. Like that, <laughs> that, that kind of gives you a leg up on people. They were signed in the mid '80s by Run DMC's label, and they actually saw some success with the, mostly with this song. It would get them some MTV play, but ultimately. Uh, this is all they would ever be really known for. And uh, even though they're still technically a band today. So, but there's a gigantic gap. So it's like they recorded like an 83, album 83, album 84, album 86, and then nothing, nothing. Then 2018. Hey guys, we're back. <laughs> so good luck to boys. Don't cry. Coming to a state fair near you. <laughs> Our last song is Get Off, written by Prince Rogers Nelson. And if that name sounds familiar, that's because it is, of course, Prince. Why mm. they listed Prince Rogers Nelson on the uh, soundtrack, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yes, performed by Prince and the New Gen new Power Generation. And Prince is just the iconic singer, songwriter, record producer, actor, dancer, filmmaker. His career spanned four decades. He was a guitar virtuoso. And still, I would, hand I would argue anyone still one of the top god top five greatest guitarists in music history i don't care what you say and just all around legend his hits include i want to be your lover kiss when doves cry little red corvette purple rain which purple rain also included a movie for 24 weeks it sat on top of the billboard 200 it sold 25 million copies the movie grossed $68 million in the box office, did $80 million worldwide, and had a budget of only $7.2 Like, that... 
that amount of money he made on that movie alone is insane. And on top of all of that, he just produced hit after hit in the 80s. Even like during the 80s, his backing band, The Revolution, would leave in the mid 80s. He would release as a solo artist, and then in 91, around this time, he would debut the new Power Generation as his backing band and would be successful with them. He would also write songs for a number of artists. He wrote Manic Monday by the Bengals. He also wrote Nothing Compares to You, which was eventually covered by Sinead O'Connor and pretty much is Sinead O'Connor's career, was her career. And also that song was uh, also covered by uh, Chris Cornell, the late Chris Cornell before he died. And it is one of my favorite covers of all time. But he was also instrumental in a number of people's career. He was instrumental in the careers of Vanity and the careers of the band The Time and Morris Day and The Time specifically. They wouldn't be anything without Prince. And to think like he started out as an opening act for Rick James. Like that was where he started. Wow. And there was a point in time in which everything Prince did was just gold. He was asked by Tim Burton to do several songs for the 1989 Batman movie. Instead, he did he made an entire nine song soundtrack that would peak at number one on the Hot 100 <laughs> and on b chart. Like, Perfect. like Tim Burton asked him to do like one song. He did nine songs. They all it, the album went to number one for a number of weeks. Like, like, <laughs> like just completely killed it. And alas, all of the great ones leave too soon. So, but that is our music. This took a turn that I was not prepared for. I mean, uh, notable old man Pat Boone aside, <laughs> that it also included Fleetwood Mac and Prince. So, of course, always the music takes a turn that we're never ready for. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie, The Infamous Last Boy Scout. All right, Melissa, I'm going to have <laughs> gonna you go to me. I'm like, God, yeah. kick off <laughs> our final thoughts on The Last Boy Scout. What's your takeaway on this movie? I have none. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, no I love, well, first of all, I mean, obviously I like, I really like Bruce Willis, so... I, I'm pretty much it. I don't. I've never seen a Bruce Willis movie that I didn't like. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good movie. I think that we're all going to touch on it. It doesn't age well. There's some stuff in there that's kind of offensive. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's really fun to watch, and uh, it's one of the greatest. You know, it's, it's one of the of the era of blow up things and shoot people. It it, it definitely takes a number one in that that category. I don't like per se. I don't necessarily know why they put Damon Wayans in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely the weak point for me. <laughs> I like him. I just don't think he's the right fit for that role. I think there could have been... I, there's, there's a lot of other people I, that I could have put in that role that maybe would have carried it a little bit further. I, I understand that Dean Wayne was really popular at that time and that probably felt like that was the right moment to put him in that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like they were just trying to go for the they needed the the comedy relief like it's a good movie it it fulfills what we want it blows things up there's a little bit of heart in there where he's you know he's trying to be a dad not a good dad <laughs> for the record he's not a good dad i don't know about what kind of husband he is but he's not a good dad <laughs> and then you we have conflicting theories on the daughter i think she's annoying you guys she's a badass there's that <laughs> but it fulfills bruce willis for me so and halle berry as a stripper who can say no to that <laughs> john what are your final thoughts i want to talk about the plot of the movie a little bit so in 1991 free agents are killing the game and no sports betting and like everything like the premise apparently made sense but here in 2019 most states have legalized sports sports gaming a lot of states have it so legal that you can game you can literally bet on football on your phone or on fantasy football you can bet on fantasy football none of this plot would work today it's gone to a complete 180 since this since that time uh so like none of the actual plot of this movie holds up nowadays because like they're going through all of this trouble to hide a conspiracy to kill a senator to get legislation passed so that sports gambling will be legal to save the NFL. And in 2019, the NFL was doing just fine and now sports gambling is legal despite what the NFL wants. The NFL owners didn't want gambling to be legal. I just think it's funny that like the entire plot of the movie now is just just 
couldn't happen. That's just kind of what jumps out at me. If you were to take a step back, like, actually, they made a movie about a cross between Robert Kraft and Jerry Jones. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. My final thoughts here, some notes about behind the scenes on this movie. First of all, this is a juggernaut cast that is on mm -hmm. here. Shane Black, Tony Scott, Joel Silver making a movie. This has Bruce Willis, Damon Wayans, Chelsea Field, Halle Berry, Halle Berry Bruce McGill, Kim Coates. Like, this movie has people at the top of their game, at their peak of popularity. This movie, including in the music, people from Fleetwood Mac and Prince, this has stars all the way through in every sense of the meaning. And it floundered horribly in production and in filming and in editing. And it made money, but it didn't do great. It didn't now, do what they thought it was going to mm -hmm. do. Now, Shane Black sold this script for a record $1.7 million at the time. And then he eventually broke that record again later, selling another script. So this movie, from the very beginning, the the expectations were through the roof. Did it deliver on it? I think so. It's got still got a strong following. It's still really good. It's still definitely a Tony Scott movie. It's not as good as what it could be. And I think it's just because, according to the people who worked on there and the things that I read, is that it, went on, it, it underwent a lot of script changes on set to accomplish what it was that the studio wanted to do and like being careful about talking about certain things the script goes crazy and goes off in other areas the, he, he, people who have read the script like the script better than what the end movie ended up being which mm. the script ended with a boats in fog and like people shooting at each other out on the water and like all this other crazy crap that happens and so this mm. movie still is still really good i really enjoy it. this is why i love tony scott is for these kinds of movies in reality it's a miracle it got made and it ever saw the light of day and so we are thankful yes. for joel silver and tony <laughs> scott and shane black pulling this together because apparently bruce willis was a bitch to work with on set when he was at his peak popularity uh -huh. in 1991. The last point that I'm going to make here before I close out is not necessarily anything on the movie, but about this era. And it's making me uncomfortable. Our era of movies is now starting to age out. And for our age, 60s and 70s movies are the things that we look back at when we were youngins in our 20s. We look back at and we're like, ooh, that didn't age very well. Oh, I can't believe they used those kinds of words and they said that kind of thing. And, and they filmed that thing this way. Well, now our movies from the 90s are starting to age out. And young people today are looking at our movies and going, oh, I can't believe you said that. And watch, me watching this movie and some other movies from the early 90s, like, oh, maybe they're right. It was very cringeworthy. There yeah, was lots of moments few, where you're like, oh, wow, that's yeah, really not we good. said that. And that impression of Prince that Damon Wayans <laughs> yeah. does. Like, oh, <laughs> man. How many of these movies are we going to watch and go like, oh, yeah. Our movies, our era of movies aren't going to age well either mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with this movie that's that is it's just the era and it's just it's it's hard what it's hard for me is it's like just acknowledging that i'm getting old that my <laughs> that my the uh -huh. movies from my era are no longer fit with the cultural uh stigma you that's know, expected in movies you know uh, and, and i completely understand that and i think we're going to see a number of these where we're going to do that exact same thing where it's like it's kind of cringeworthy at times and that's going to do it for us this week on go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com i mentioned the watchman in the very beginning we'd love to hear from you on that we'd love to hear from you about the last boy scout does it still hold up the things that are inside of this movie what do you think of that jig i don't think it's much of a jig when he's up there on top of that scoreboard <laughs> no that was I not a jig question bruce willis's <laughs> jig ability we would love to hear <laughs> what, from you what, what do you think happened to the six million <laughs> Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. You can get us on Twitter at go with the heat, Facebook.com slash go with the heat, Instagram.com slash go with the heat. We are easy to find. Contact us in any of those ways. We would love, please send us messages. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the show notes, all the ways to subscribe. We are literally everywhere regular RSS, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. You name it, we're there. You can find us on any of those platforms. Go to that website, goldtheheat.com, to find out more on all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to contact us, and all the show notes and everything from this episode that I've stolen from several different websites and compiled all into a single page <laughs> all about The Last Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. Bye.